welcome to the Payments.com digital discussion on moving payments from cards to mobile wallets. I'm Karen Webster. If it feels like we've been talking about mobile wallets for a while, it's probably because we have. Back in 2004, when NTT Docomo launched its iMode mobile payments capability in Japan, the world watched in fascination as phones were used to do, and I quote, unprecedented functions including buying train passes and paying for things previously only possible with a plastic card. I can remember then thinking how cool it might be to organize a mobile safari to Japan to see just how people were using their phones instead of cards to pay for things. There was that much of a focus on how Japan was showing the world the way forward with mobile phones and payments. But now here we are, more than a dozen years later, with smartphone adoption in the U.S. at 80% of all mobile phone owners and on track to hit just about 70% of all people in the U.S. by the end of this year. E-commerce volumes are growing double digits each year and now account for 9.1% of all retail sales, and nearly a quarter of that overall volume is driven by sales made via the mobile device. Nearly half of that is with one very famous Seattle-based retailer by the name of Amazon. But with the increasing dependence on mobile devices to do everything, including shop and pay, comes the great responsibility of all of us to deliver a digital experience that meets the expectations of these consumers. Friction-free, fast, secure, and very much putting the consumer in control, which is the nexus of our discussion today. How can all of us in payments and commerce and retail leverage the great potential of the mobile device, not just to replicate the activities that people do today with their plastic cards, but to totally reinvent the experience? I'm delighted to be joined by John Rosner, VP Product Strategy at Fiserv. Hey, John, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kara. Thank you. And uh, would you have gone on that mobile safari for me back in two, with, with me back in 2004? Absolutely, right? The, the chance to see innovation, right, out in the wild, so to speak, to continue your safari analogy, um, I would have jumped on that, that plane in a, in a second. I, I actually almost pulled it together, but, um, but, but let's get into the conversation today. We've got a lot of rich material here, and I don't want to waste a minute of it. Um, I, I talked about the digital expectations and user engagement intersection, you know, almost the conundrum that uh, we're all trying to see our way through. But but why don't you add a little color commentary to that and get us and get us started? No, absolutely. And so I, I think Karen, you're you're absolutely right. Right when we thought about things over a decade ago, it was very much focused on using the phone for a payment and replacing digital with analog. But what happens, right, in the ensuing decade is consumers' expectations have been very much shaped by the world around them and particularly what's happening with, with smartphones. Um, and not just those expectations shifting, is that we're at the point, right, when we're looking 10 years into this, really understanding the impact that having a consumer's engagement through digital channels has on their behavior and what that does. And all of us see it in our day-to-day -day life, um, whether you're an Amazon Prime customer or have shifted your television viewing habits to Netflix, um, all of us can see how our daily lives are changing, how our behavior is changing, um, and we're seeing that as well in the world of payments and financial services. You know, I, I, I like the second bullet on user engagement, engaging consumers to help reduce fraud. I, I think there are some interesting applications and lessons from that, um, but, but we'll, and we'll get to that in, in, just, in just a few slides from now. But, John, run us through, you know, the level set of, of, of the landscape with respect to what's creating or setting the consumer's expectations around digital. Sure. I mean, you know, expectations are being set around digital is, is really putting the consumer first and foremost in control, right? Consumers today, right, know what they want, um, 
they know they want things now, uh, they want things easy, and they want to be in control to, to take charge to meet their to meet their needs, right? Attention spans are, are going down quite radically. Our brains are, are literally being rewired by the devices in our hands. And so uh, people, right? Not, I mean, I like talking about people instead of consumers, right? Um, people want to, to be in control to make things easier, right? They don't have the patience that we all did a decade or two ago. Um, and that's the expectations that they that they have, and and often until maybe machine learning catches up or gets to where it needs to be from a potential perspective, um, they're often the best uh, people, right? The best equipped to to address things like fraud. Um, as something that continues to to rise um, increasingly, um, every seemingly inexorably, um, month over month, year over year. So, so let's talk a little bit about the stats. I mean, I, I alluded to some of these at the very beginning, smartphone adoption accelerating. Um, you know, you've got a chart here. It's, you know, it's a big, it's, it's, it's a lot. People are, people not only have cell phones, they increasingly have little mini computers in their, in their hands, in their wallets, I mean, in their, in their pockets, in their purses that give them a lot of potential to do lots of things that were once only done on desktop. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, and so before um, people thought about really analog channels, um, and so that, that, right, that, that cell phone is fundamentally an analog channel, even though it started using some digital technology compared to, to landlines, right? But the, the adoption of smartphones, right, that adoption curve is just, is just really steep. You can see how, you know, that the slope of that curve compared to the adoption of cell phones is, is much higher. As all of us are getting more and more comfortable of adopting new and new technologies, right? And what that smartphone has done is, as that computing power has increased faster and faster with Moore's law, right? As uh, speeds of internet access has increased more and more, and the cost of data has continued to plummet, um, the use of smartphones increased. Right, and all of us right are using those phones more and more for every aspect of our lives. Downloading more and more apps to do more and more uh, purpose-built, single-built mobile applications to make life easy. That is what is sort of resetting consumer expectations. Right, the expectation that you know an app is updated, you know, every couple of weeks or once a week. Um, mm -hmm. People have the expectation that things will continue and improve, and they don't need a manual for it. Right, that that brands that they're interacting with are going to see what they're trying to do on their devices and see what they're doing and begin to just make things easier and put that consumer more in control and make it as seamless as possible to do what they what they need to do. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think it, you know, the, the smartphone with apps makes those kinds of things so accessible. I, I, I always refer to my 82-year-old dad who you know, is happy as a clam on his uh, on his smartphone. He knows how to use it. He's you know the app happy guy, um, and it's you know hats off to uh, to the ecosystem around mobile that just makes that experience um, very very user intuitive. Speaking of which, let's talk about the speaker of which. Um, talk about no friction. Right. So what's really interesting? What's happening um, with with voice? Right, particularly, um, you know, voice and mobile, right, is that concept of just taking friction out, right? You can start with an app, right? A mobile app started with, right, an easier way to, to access the digital capability, right, in a kind of very simple, streamlined, purpose-built um, mobile application from an interface perspective, right? And then what you see with, with Amazon Echo is taking that ethos of design thinking to the next level, right? And it's, you know, Alexa, I want I want a pony, right? And the answer is, okay, sending pony now, and you insert whatever you want here. But what's interesting is you think about this experience is what does not happen? What don't you see in the consumer experience here, right? And think about all of the, 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 the decades um, for all of us standing in line in the supermarket, we're saying, you know, cash or check. These are masters. Um, that that conversation doesn't is not is nowhere in the Amazon Echo experience, right? There's no question about what payment you want or 
how you want to make a choice or give me car data, right? There, there is none of that there. And so you have a much more seamless experience um, as you think about what's happening with embed and payments, right? Not so that the goal is to have embed and payments, but it's really re-engineering and re-imagining what that commerce experience is. It's all about the removal of friction. Speaking of friction, um, standing in line, that's a real pain. Exactly, and so, you know, you know, we're here today just to kind of talk about payments, right, with an eye towards financial institutions, but really, again, we, you know, financial institutions, we, they, they're, they're customers, they're members, right, they're people, right, and, and people, um, right, or users, if you're thinking about design, design thinking, um, right, the concept that I like to talk about is friction, right? Where it's very generally divided is, is anything that prevents a user from completing an action, right? And so the Alexa is a great example of putting in card information, but how many times, right, Karen, have you had the experience or other folks had the experience where you're on the way to work in the morning or you're catching an early morning flight at an airport and you, you know, walk by that Starbucks and there's a line out the door, right? It's rush hour at Starbucks. Um, and half the time, right, you're, Sometimes you're going to wait, and half the time, like, you know what, I'll just be grumpy and cranky today <laughs> because it's not worth standing online for half an hour or 20 minutes. Um, and that's really tough for Starbucks. It's, think about their brand, right? They just, that was a negative brand impression, right? That was a lost sale, right? And when you have, you know, that negative brand impression, right, a, a, a consumer is, is more likely to, to then be open to, an, to another brand, right? And, and the lifetime value of that individual would then go down. Um, and so what did Starbucks do, right? They said, okay, their digital solution was, was order ahead um, as a way for, for their customers to bypass the line. And this is actually a, a snapshot, <laughs> Karen, of, of my, my mobile app, so in case you're wondering what my go-to drink at Starbucks is, you can, you, can, you can see. But, you know, for me, just to make it real personal, um, Right. I, I often work remote on, on Fridays after a, a long week of, of traveling or commuting, and I've got a standing 8 a.m. morning call, and I've got that choice in the morning of, do I attempt to brew my own? Do I want to run out to, to grab a, a cup of coffee? And it's, it's just so seamless with Starbucks, right, where I go in the app, I've got my favorite, I hit buy, and then it's, it's available sort of four minutes later. I get in my car, I drive to Starbucks, I walk in, and my drink is literally waiting for me. Um, and there's a literally, a, there's a line of people out the door because it's downtown in the city and everyone is there in the morning to get their, their caffeine fix. Um, and that was Starbucks' really innovative solution to, to that problem of friction. Because friction does get in the way of people completing an action. And the, again, that impact that you have on the brand loyalty and customer lifetime value you know, becomes significant over time. Yeah, it, it's also 20% of their transactions now. And, you know, our data, I'm sure lots of other people have similar data. Um, you know, when, when people order ahead, they often order more. Maybe it's easy to add on, but it's also a uh, deliberate add-on where someone, for example, ordering ahead on the way home may order extra for lunch the next day. So there's the incremental lift with respect to, you know, not only removing friction, but just making it easy for consumers to, to add on more stuff. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we all know where Starbucks is, is today, right? But What's more interesting, right, is you think about the consumer expectations, right? So Starbucks launches in September 2015, and then less than nine months later, Dunkin' Donuts comes out with, with the same functionality, right? And it's, it's interesting when you look at Dunkin' Donuts clearly trying to grow, but at the same time owned by private equity, might not be as keen to make those significant investments in digital and mobile, but, but really didn't have a choice, right? The, the market moving in a certain way, consumers begin to have an expectation. And if you're a consumer that says, well, I can avoid a line at Starbucks, but I have to wait in line in Dunkin' Donuts, or what's now Dunkin', right? Um, it, it becomes a, a very easy choice over time for a segment of, of people. Um, and now it's, it's hard to walk into a, a Dunkin' store without being order ahead, plastered all over the store in terms of encouraging that behavior and letting consumers know that that functionality is, is available. 
Plus, uh, you know, when the Patriots win, uh, you get uh, you get benefits, 87 cents the next day, because that's Gronk's number. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Duncan does good stuff with Absolutely. respect to Supreme. I would have spoken about the Jets, the Giants, but we can leave it at the Patriots. Yeah, and, that, yeah, and you, you, and you, 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 you definitely don't want to bring that up. Um, okay, so uh, so let's talk about more friction. Yeah, so if you think about friction, right, it's, it's, it's all great to see what's happening outside, but like, what does that look like in the world of, of payments, right? And, and here's an example looking at, at Apple Pay uh, with Bank of America, right, that, you know, oftentimes you're looking to add a, a debit or, or credit card to Apple Pay, you'll go down what's called a yellow path, right, which in this yeah. case required a, a phone call for the consumer to call call this case Bank of America in order to complete the action and get that card into into Apple Pay, right? And, you know, from a, a banker perspective, this makes all the sense in the world that, you know, thinking about fraud and risk and all these controls that are really top of mind for financial institutions. But you also have to, as you know, as, as, if you're driving digital transformation, really think about what's the impact on the consumer, right? And there's a healthy tension between between fraud and and friction. Um, and this is just an example. It's not just friction. And as you're thinking about shopping for cards, when you look internally uh, within financial services, within the payments and banking space, you could see examples like this this everywhere, right? And it's incumbent upon all of us in the industry to to find ways to mitigate and remove some of this friction if we're going to drive that consumer adoption. Because uh, it's probably the rare consumer, right? It's probably not every consumer that's going to be eager to jump through those hoops. Um, everyone's distracted. You've got kids screaming in the background or something else getting your attention. It's easily on to the next thing without completing the task. So what's the punchline? So the, the punchline here, right, is it's when you want to look at friction, so how do you understand and where to, where to focus on? When you think about digital and you think about moving more online and into mobile phones, um, I always like to talk about understanding consumer behavior, right? You can think about that prior example. It might seem like a lot of friction, but you want to look at the data to understand, well, how much friction is there? How many consumers fall out of that that funnel or that purchase path? And so I just I love this picture. I'm not sure Karen if you've seen this in your own life going to a, a, a park, you know, downtown or perhaps a, a quad at a college campus, right? We see this all the time. Right? Um, people find the best thing, the best way forward in terms of what they want to do, regardless of how a, a system is designed. And really understanding how to look at behavior, see what consumers, what the consumer is doing and what they're trying to doing, and then making the path easier. Because if you actually go to some of the best managed, you know, parks or, or universities in the country, you won't see these dirt paths because what they'll do is they'll, they'll pave over them and lay the cobblestones mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. redesign based on where people are going. Um, in order to remove that, that friction and know where to invest the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think your, your next example using um, adapting messaging to what's important to consumers, I think is a really interesting application of user behavior data. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and so this is an example that we we did at FiveServe is we launched this, this mobile application called Card Valet that mm -hmm. enabled cardholders to set controls on their on their debit and credit cards as well as receive alerts on where those cards are used or if a control is violated. And there were a lot of hypotheses that the controls are what's most important to consumers, that's the message that's going to resonate based on what some other players had done in the industry, particularly I think Discover was one of the, the first to market with this feature a couple of years ago. And then we looked mm -hmm. at the data and said, well, how are cardholders 
using the mobile application. There's a lot of features around controls, a lot of features around alerts, and, and how are they taking advantage of it? And, and what do we need to do? What we found is it was a small minority of consumers that were engaging or, or, or triggering a control in terms of how their debit or credit card was spent. And the overwhelming majority of the users of the application were using alerts for all transactions focused on preventing fraud. And hmm. in doing so, we, we looked at that data and said, okay, well, what do we do with this data? Let's, we're clearly adding a lot of value to our cardholders and our financial institutions. We'll talk about some of that later on, Karen. But we said, let's try to drive adoption. There's a nugget here. We see how people are using it. And we completely switched our, our messaging um, to be human-centered based on that consumer behavior. It, it, interesting, because it's, it's really, in both situations, it's about control, but it's just putting it in a context that's more relevant to the consumer. And I, I wonder, do you, do you think that the association with fraud is, is because consumers are now so much in tune with the risk of fraud and stolen financials and and credentials being available so widely now on the dark web? Are, are consumers just more in touch with that as a concept? Yeah, I think the brand, aware, the, 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 let's say it's a poor terminology, maybe the brand awareness of fraud, right, has been going up and, you know, maybe the first big shift was a number of years ago with the target breach, but the, right. the news kept on coming, right? Um, so I think it, it is increasingly top of mind, so it's becoming a, far more universal need uh, for people in the United States. And not to say that there isn't a segment of the population that controls are important for, but that, that need to control versus the need to be more aware and help manage and protect against fraud is far more applicable um, given the, the media cycle that we have and the frenzy that's out there with the 24-7 news cycle. And, uh, whether we like it or not, fraud, uh, consumer fraud, really just somehow it makes the headlines. I mean, well, it's, yeah. also, it's also putting the consumer on, you know, on the issuer's team, right? Because uh, if if the consumer is engaged in uh, in monitoring their accounts in 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 real time, um, they can help detect situations that are fraudulent. Um, before it gets uh, it gets worse, so I think I think that's a that's also an interesting byproduct, if you will. Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, which almost you know as as it kind of shifts over into kind of our, our next section, Karen. Right, when we think about the payments landscape, right here at Pfizer, you know we've been in payments and financial services for for over three decades now, and. We survey households in the U.S. on a on an annual basis to really track um, consumer segment, you know, uh, sediments um, over time from a longitudinal perspective. And you know, one of those big themes that's that's coming up to your point about being control is you know you're looking at quote you know over a third of consumers that are profiled are looking for tools that keep up with their busy lifestyle, right? That make it easier easier for them, right, um, that people don't have the time, right, one in four households admit they don't have enough time to manage their finances the way, the way they want, right, they know that fraud's important, so they might not have the tools to, to do it the way they need to, right, checking in and reviewing statements on a monthly basis, clearly something everyone should do is the best practice, but might not fit into someone's busy lifestyle, um, and having mobile solutions on the go is, is clearly something that fits into consumers' expectations. John, is, is financial management tools defined as um, broad as, as savings, or is this a more narrow definition around payments and transaction activity and balances and things like that? This is really um, more broad, right, as you okay. think about right, your financial wellness and health and financial, man financial management in general. Um, payments as a component of that, right? And, you know, even just to, to highlight, um, right, 60% of these respondents, right, said that managing money is something they have to do and not something that they want to do, right? And managing money is anything, everything from savings to 
um, keeping track of your, your credit card balances and your, your debit card transactions. Right, got it. Um, let's talk about expectations around faster and real time. This is an, another interesting hot topic. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, it's, it's all about instant and real time, right? And this is being shaped by, right, again, having that phone in your pocket and everything available all the time. Um, right, when we look at how households define real time, right, nearly 70% define that as as real time, right, within immediately or within a few seconds. And when we think about, right, how that concept of a, a wallet evolves from just kind of making a payment to doing, helping managing your, your finances, managing your debit cards, your credit cards, and everything around banking, it's all about being able to do things right away, right, and, and being able to do things through a digital channel where that functionality, that request is, is visible, completed, actioned, and confirmed immediately. Um, that's what, what consumers really expect. Um, and that's why Amazon is doing everything they're doing with, with drones. And they literally, I think Karen announced last night that for, I think, a large number of Prime members within the United States, there's free same-day shipping from now until yep. Christmas, right? Yep. And so. Yep. Everyone is moving towards this on how do we how do we get to instant? And I think the good news is, you know, at least within financial services and payments, um, when you think about debit and credit cards, by definition, right, those are instant. So we've got a strong foundation. And how do we really think about those wraparound products and services um, to help manage what consumer expectations are with everything else they need to do for um, for those products? And yeah, John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you, you, you kind of skip through the, the next couple of these. Great data, but I'm going to be quiet because I'm, I'm interested in moving through. So just, just go through the next couple slides, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment at the end. Sure. So moving on to the, the next slide, right, it's, you know, consumers have more and more choice for financial services, right? The rise of um, fintech startups, and, you know, even we spent some time talking about Starbucks with the, you know, I think, you know, billions of dollars that they have um, on account, right? So the world is becoming fragmented. Um, what, what is interesting in, in surveys that we've done is that consumers still look towards their primary financial institution for recommendations, right, and for advice on, on those financial solutions, right? So for now, um, Financial institutions in the United States still have right momentum behind them and a bit of a moat to maintain and build and deepen consumer relationships. Um, but that bar, those expectations are being set um, by those those big digital brands coming out of Silicon Valley and the West Coast, as well as the, the fintech startups. So um, it's you know that that there's that phrase burning platform and that that. That platform is definitely, if not roaring fire, is beginning to, to, to simmer and smoke. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we, we have the same, you know, results from some of the, the studies we've done talking to consumers. I mean, they do trust their bank. Um, and the card brands uh, for enabling payment and financial services, they do. But, you know, clearly the expectations, as you point out, are being set by the other fintechs that offer other experiences digitally. So I think that's where some of the tension, some of the tension rests as well. Um, let's move in now to the next topic, which is which is loyalty and engagement. No, that's, so I think that's, that's a great transition, right? So if we think about, well, how do you drive loyalty? How do you drive engagement, particularly in the digital space? Um, Right, rewards are a, a critical component, right? I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in the in the payments industry that didn't either jump on the Chase Sapphire bandwagon or was watching it pretty closely, but rewards are increasingly getting more and more competitive and more and more broad, both across debit and credit, right? Um, as they're a proven mechanism for driving that reinforcement of consumer consumer behavior, right? And think about well, how do we add value to payments and, and really drive that engagement and brand awareness. Um, 
as we think about, um, you know, we there's some work that was done by Mercator and asked cardholders just point blank, you know, what will get you to use your card, in this case a credit card, more often? And over 50% said that rewards would help, right? Which is not surprising, right? So you ask, you know, kind of, you can do that research. Um, and people might tell you what they think or what they want to hear. And, you know, at least here at Fiserv, we looked across our client base and said, well, is that really true and what happened? And what's really interesting here when we think about digital and, and engagements and, and really building that loyalty, what we did here, Karen, is we, we indexed and look at some data, index spend at, at 100 across debit and credit clients, and well, what happened to spend when a cardholder had, you know, went and registered for awards and said, you know what, I want to go earn rewards on this debit card or earn rewards on this credit card. And just the act of engaging digitally and beginning to earn rewards and see that point balance on their statement and see the point balance online go up with every purchase, you know, you see a 30 to 60% increase in spend. What's most interesting, though, is when you think, we look at cardholders that redeemed, right? They, they actualized the value of those points, right? They, they went online, they redeemed <coughs> points for, for, for a trip. Um, or perhaps a, a new a new iPhone, or um, you know even a even a gift card or cash back, you saw a significant engagement and lift in spend over folks that were registered, right? Because you're creating that that virtuous cycle, right? Um, where you're rewarding behavior, consumer sees the reward, gets the reward, right? Gets that dopamine hit in their brain in terms of pleasure if something <laughs> positive happened. Um, and that reinforces the positive behavior, right? Um, and that's really important that it's, it's, and we'll talk about fraud in a bit, right? But the consumer becomes front of mind. They're in control. They're deciding how they're earning points, seeing their, seeing their, their earning points, um, and, and getting, you know, ultimately kind of pleasure and satisfaction from that activity, which then deepens engagement with the brand and increases lifetime value. Yeah, it, 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 it shifts preference to, to a, a product where the consumer does feel as though they're getting they're getting rewarded in the way that's important to them. You know, maybe it's not necessarily uh, points, but it could be cash back or something like that, where the consumer is is engaging with a product because the rewards are relevant for how they wish to redeem. That's absolutely right, right? And those redeemers are across all, all sectors. And, you know, some of the best practices we've seen is having rewards programs that do have options, right? And give, mm -hmm. give consumers those choice based on what, what is most important to them. Right, and as we think about adoption, right, when you know, there's, there's a lot of research out there about how important mobile is, right? And, and not just mobile, right, but to, to visually see the, the points, right, and, and seeing the impact of those points accumulate over time, right? The, right, the term that we've been talking about for a few, a few years is gamification, right? right. Um, and I heard you laugh, Karen, I said kind of the word the dopamine hit, but that is really and truly what is happening, right, with the mobile devices that are in our hands, right, as we're, we're craving Right, that next update on Facebook, the next update on Twitter, right? Even if you're, as an example, right, if you're texting within an iPhone, right, in, in an iMessage to another user, you text it, you hit go, you hear that sound of the message going off, and the other person is typing, you don't see what they're typing, but you've got that sort of someone is typing window, right? Because it's that positive reinforcement that something next is going to happen next. And that's exactly the same thing for awards, right? That our brains are conditioned for that 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 hook, right? That hook, that positive reinforcement, and seeing those rewards visibly, one that consumers expected, and two, it then drives that that loyalty and and engagement with the brand. Yeah, I, I, and I think how that's messaged, um, and where that's messaged. I mean, being immediately visible, I think, is is, is really important. Otherwise, it becomes too abstract. Um, but I also think it serves to, to your point, it, it, it increases the momentum to get to a goal, whatever that goal happens to be. 
and uh, I think there are there are products that do very very well at, uh, at at giving consumers the feedback and the metric on where on where they are, and uh, there are a lot that need to uh, that need to adopt those best practices. Absolutely correct, right? And not be afraid of investing in loyalty, right? And investing in that currency, right? Because it's it's not an expense, right? It's it's really an investment that yields significant dividends in terms of consumer loyalty and lifetime value. So is it time to talk about mobile payments, my my, my most favorite topic in the world? It is I sorry, my mouth had gotten stuck, so I apologize there. <laughs> <laughs> it's sticking for the past twenty seconds. <laughs> So, you know, if we think about mobile payments, right, it's, it's a topic that is near and dear to so many people's heart, right? And the way that we like to think about mobile payments is it's any payment that's completed on a mobile device, right? So it's not even that narrow definition where it might be those three wallets between Apple Pay and Android Pay and Samsung Pay. It's really saying, right, a payment or a commerce transaction that's complete on a device and, right, estimates Right, and studies that are done and stuff, you know, in the next couple of years, three years out, right, half of all online spend will come from a mobile device, um, which is a pretty astonishing statistic. Yeah. And Karen, explain, we talked about kind of the mobile payment adoption. You started off by going back over a decade into Japan and kind of where we're going to be. And we get the question all the time, well, what's going on with adoption and, and, and why are we there? Are we not there? And, you know, here at Pfizer, we've been tracking adoption of various technologies for, for decades, right? And we we did some interesting work earlier this year to, to plot adoption based on uh, our annual survey that we do of online banking against digital wallets. And you, what we see is actually something really interesting, right? That you've got kind of a similar adoption curve between these two things. And again, that slope of a digital wallet is, is a bit sharper, right, as people are adopting technology faster. And the question is, you look at online banking today, and it's fairly ubiquitous in terms of um, consumers using online banking instead of just going into the branch. Um, but that's not where we were, you know, over, you know, you know, 20 years ago. And you look at, well, what is it at what changed? If we think back to 1998, we were sort of still doing dial-up, right? If we were lucky enough, right, we just upgraded from our 14.4 bought up to a 28.8, right? Um, logging in through, through America Online. And what was happening in 1998 is you were just beginning to get into DSL, right? Mm -hmm. Access yep. was, was there, right? And when you first got into online banking, you can go in there and see a balance, and you really couldn't do much anything else. And as you think about the next few years in the late 90s, right, that DSL started spreading. It became easier and faster to go online. And banks started adding more, right, there were more banks that started having online banking, right? You couldn't, not that people did online banking, not many banks had online banking services. And so that, as we think about the situation, that begins to drive adoption. Something very similar when we think about digital wallets, right? Apple Pay launching back in, in 2014, right, that capability was available on just the latest iPhone, right? Today, it's not possible to buy a product from Apple that doesn't have Apple Pay embedded in it. Um, same thing with, right, Android phones, right? And when you think about Apple Pay launching in the beginning, you had a, a handful of bar key retailers, and you look at acceptance today, years later, um, and you're looking at, you know, close to, you know, 50% of retail locations by, you know, the top 500 retailer locations by the end of this year. And so that's what we're seeing is you, you need to have some of the, the foundation in place and drive that that consumer adoption. But ultimately, right, Karen, it's about, you know, having having a better experience, right? Um, in terms of like, well, why would someone use their phone and is it is it easier? And it's, it's funny, Karen, you know, I the first time I used Apple Pay was with uh, with my daughter. She's uh she's twelve years old and I think we're in a, a Dunkin' Donuts. And I uh, paid something, took out my phone, and, and paid. And she looked at me and said, Daddy, that is the most amazing thing ever. It's so much easier. Why would you ever use your card? And I looked at her and said, well, can you explain to me why, why this is? And she said, well, Daddy, it's very simple, right? If you want to use a card, you have to take your wallet out of your pocket. You have to take your card out of your wallet. You have to swipe your card. You have to wait. You have to hit next. You have to sign. You have to click OK. 
You have to get a receipt. You have to fold the receipt up. You have to take the receipt and put it in your wallet, take the card, put it in your wallet, take your wallet back in the card. Daddy, that's a lot of work. And your phone's right in your hand and you're done. And it, it seems, you know, through the eyes of a 12-year-old, it does seem like a Rube Goldberg approach to making a payment when all of us are sitting in line in stores with our phones in our hands anyway. Um, and so at least for me, that was a little bit eye-opening when you think about how easy it is, and particularly with Apple Pay, right, with that haptic touch, right, um, that you feel, right, again, that positive reinforcement, you know when the transaction is complete, um, in contrast to, say, a, an EMV transaction where is that a good beep or a bad beep with taking my card out? All right, John. I'll I'll, I'll leave my I'll 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 not get up on my soapbox about the uh, about mobile payments adoption in store. I mean, it suffice it to say that I think there still needs to be you know more more interest on the part of consumers to do more than just substitute a form factor. I mean, I I think I think we all agree to that. Absolutely, um, but I do think there's a very different use case. We think about adoption. Four years ago versus today in terms of in-app payments and in-app friction, right? Yep. When you think about using an Apple Pay, um, right, or a Samsung Pay, right, within a mobile device where you can bypass entering all of those payment credentials with the touch of a button, um, it mm -hmm. clearly removes friction. We're thinking of going back to that Alexa example earlier that we, we started with. Um, really does make things easier for consumers, and to the extent that you we see more and more of the proliferation um, within apps to, to make that experience better. Um, that clearly is something that we're seeing some traction with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the interesting, the interesting horizon will, will be to see how these experiences uh, port across channels because there's still this very different experience in using one method of payment in app, one method of payment in store, and a different method of payment um, via mobile browser. And I think that's where a lot of fragmentation and friction becomes. Consumers don't want to have to keep track of, a, of the different brands. That's why cards, even card on file, is still a very popular way of payment because consumers don't have to think about it. But anyway, let's, let's move on. I'm conscious of our time. Yeah, so moving forward pretty quickly, right, we, you know, there's some data out there from MasterCard, right, which basically sort of is indicating that, um, right, when consumers and cardholders start using some of those mobile wallets, they, they do see a, a spend lift, right? And a lot of that's around, you know, increasing frequency of use and, and brand presence. And the lift is a little, is the majority of that lift is actually um, outside of, of the wallet, right? So having that good experience within a wallet for those consumers that were the early adopters and figured it out, um, having a positive experience there translated into a stronger affiliation with the brand and increase in, in sort of ordinary plastic spend. Do you think that's because they, that consumers are registering a card that they use anyway in the in the wallet? I mean, is there any evidence to show that they're establishing preference because of a different card was put into the mobile wallet than what they might ordinarily use? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely possible, Karen. I think what's interesting with this study, it's really measuring pre and post spend for that card that was put in the wallet, right? So was the act of putting the card in the wallet something that drove spend, or was there a decision that the consumer made to start using that card more, right? It's sometimes hard to tell, but nonetheless, definitely saying something that if you're an issuer out there, you probably want to ensure that you are enabling tokenization and mobile payments sure. to give for that choice. Sure. That's something that, that we've seen as well, looking at data across five serve issuers, that cardholders that do have token transactions in general are more engaged, right? And you think about that consumers have choice and most cardholders have multiple cards in their wallet, we think it's really incumbent upon issuers to embrace tokenization, enable tokenization for those payments. So oftentimes cardholders that want to adopt those um, are very engaged with that payment method, and you want to make sure that you're letting your card 
be there and removing that friction without forcing the cardholder to choose an, another brand. You know, it, I, I think these are, this is all really interesting um, input into what we're going to talk about next, and that is, and that is experience related to fraud. I, I'm paying attention to our time, John, and this is really an important conversation, so let's, um, let's just be conscious of our time. So moving forward to fraud, right, fraud is continuing to, to grow. It's a hockey stick that doesn't, doesn't stop accelerating. And what we're really seeing is that having engaged consumers that receive alerts right, can be a financial institution's best partner to reduce fraud. They, they're the ones that are best equipped to know what transaction is not there in order to take action to prevent a run uh, from a fraud perspective. And you know, a lot of our experience here is based on a product that Pfizer has called Card Valet, which is a mobile application that enables cardholders to receive alerts and set controls uh, for their debit and, and, and credit cards and have that with them and active and monitoring at all times. And what's sort of most interesting is you can look at the feedback right on the App Store, sort of, you know, why, at least I love digital, is consumers will tell you how they're using it and you see the, the great example here of someone self-styled as, hey, I'm viewing his app as a lifesaver, that's how they call themselves in the app review. Um, hmm. And you can see exactly how that, that alert process works, right? That a fraudster is testing it out with a pre-authorization um, and that cardholder was immediately able to, to stop and turn off that card and cancel it before any money was taken out of their account. That's interesting. That's a great story. Um, and it's through the eyes of a cardholder, right? And they're always the, the best ones to tell you what's happening. And so we looked at that anecdotal data and what we've seen, and we did a survey again across our base of our clients and cardholders that are using and what we found was an up to 53% reduction in fraud losses hmm. for those cardholders that are using that Card Valet product. Um, and what's really interesting is that, that the, the reduction in fraud increases with adoption, right? Because fraud is inherently random. And so the more, with the law of large numbers, the more uh, consumers that are using a fraud tool, the, the better the impact will have on reducing that fraud. Interesting. Really, that's a com very, very compelling chart. One of our favorites. I can see why. What's interesting, though, is you think about not just reducing fraud, right? Again, you don't have to ask people how they feel about it. They're, they tell us, right? That's the culture we have today is, is sharing everything on social media. When you look at Google Play, right? You know, the phrase peace of mind, right, resonates so strongly with so many financial financial institutions whose brands are all about safety and security and trust, and peace of mind is, is what's put, put so well. And so what happens when you have peace of mind um, is we see that the result of having higher peace of mind um, and feeling more secure about your, your payment vehicle is that you start using it more. You're less afraid if you had hesitations with using that debit or credit card for certain types of transactions. We do see a lift from an overall population perspective. And what's most interesting, yeah, and what we found was most interesting and what our clients find most interesting is, you know, how do you engage and how do you really activate cards? And this, you know, our card value product with these alerts, that we had the, the biggest lift among cardholders that were least engaged, right, which is almost that holy grail is how do you take consumers that are lightly engaged with a brand to have them become more engaged with the brand. Um, and that's exactly what we found here. That sense of safety and security appears to be um, manifesting itself from a causality perspective in increased usage. How are you finding that the cardholders are using this capability? Are they using it to monitor or, I mean, your, your prior slide suggested that they are actively engaged in turning cards on and off. Is that is that atypical or is that um, part of the behavior of of a, of a card holder that's enrolled in this program? Yeah, so the, the dominant behavior is receiving those alerts, 
right, which mm -hmm. gives them that sense of safety and security and in turn increases spend. Um, you have far fewer that are setting controls, um, similar to, I would argue, um, right, Mint is a very popular product, but it doesn't appeal to everyone in the United States in terms of having that detailed view of their personal finance. I think there are some consumers that want to set controls on where their cards are used, but having the ability to turn off a card in the event of fraud might not happen very frequently, but the ability to do so coupled with instantaneous, real-time push notifications for transactions makes for a fairly compelling user experience. You know, in, as we think about pulling all this together, you and I have chatted about this notion of, of a mobile wallet, and I alluded to the fact earlier that it, wallets really need to do more than just substitute for a form factor and provide additional value to consumers across the shopping channels they they like and frequent the most. And I think this is a an interesting depiction of of at least how how Fiserv is looking at this from the standpoint of portfolio of solutions that that issuers can take to market. Yeah, no, and I think that's absolutely right. So we're viewing right mobile what you know what was traditionally viewed as mobile wallet as let's say an NFC payment far greater, right? Consumers' expectations around the ability to self service, have instant functionality and take control of their lives. Um, is a bit greater than an NFC payment and more broad. And so as we think about a vision about what the comprehensive solutions that, that consumers are, are expecting and looking for both now and in the coming years, right, we think there's a very strong foundation with these controls and alerts as evidenced um, by the data that we've just reviewed, particularly with, with fraud growing. Um, mm -hmm. Easier digital payments um, and making that giving them the control around what those payments are and enabling access to all those wallets. And self-service is more and more critical, right? Those statistics that, you know, 60% of the consumers' households, right, don't look forward to managing their finances, right? Wanting to call an 800 number, no matter how wonderful your customer service is, is generally not something that any consumer looks forward to with any brand, for better or for worse. And so we think about self-service it's a great way to re-envision and drive digital transformation, right? One example of that, something that we're working on at, at Fiserv is, a, is travel notifications, right? The ability for a consumer, right, from within a mobile application to let their issuer know, I've got a trip coming up, I'm going for spring break uh, down to Mexico between date number one, date number two, and um, receiving the immediate confirmation that's there, giving them the comfort that they know what they want to do, they know where they're traveling, they don't have to fumble through an analog channel. And from an initial perspective, the fact that that consumer request is immediately sent to and embedded and actioned in a risk authorization system also massively simplifies operational support for the institution. And so we think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to expand that suite of self-service capabilities. And of course, you know, we've spoken about rewards and offers. Mm -hmm. uh, John, what are you hearing from your FIs in, in, in terms of where they are on the continuum of, uh, of being able to either support these five things or their interest in extending those things to their, to their cardholders? Yeah, so there's, you know, strong interest nearly across across the board, um, right? The primary areas of focus and interest that we're seeing from our, our clients is primarily around the controls and alerts as fraud is, you know, maybe not the number one, but a, a top three to five focus of any financial institution, CEO and board of directors and having a, a proven tools to combat fraud losses is, is really top of mind for them. And then the, the next big area is really around self-service um, as uh, 
financial institutions are looking for ways to deepen engagement with their cardholders, streamline operational processes so they can focus on um, value-add activities in terms of complex servicing as well as cross-sell. Uh, two, two questions related to um, acceptance, I guess, and enablement. Um, one relates to cryptocurrency. I'll let you think about that. Um, and uh, and one relates to, it's an interesting question, Chase Pay and the opportunity to enable uh, a bank-branded wallet like that through your channel. Any thoughts on either? Sure. From a cryptocurrency um, perspective, and we can have a whole hour conversation. We should. On, yes, on we should do that. We should do that another problem. time. As another time. As we think about cryptocurrencies, you know, today I, I don't think, at least in the short term, um, we're seeing uh, acceptance as cryptocurrency from a, a mass payment perspective, um, similar to a, a Visa MasterCard or another association network. So something that your advisor were clearly keeping a, a very close eye on and, and doing some uh, work and pilot partnerships in terms of blockchain as the underlying technology, but cryptocurrency as a supplemental or primary means of uh, payment transactions is not something that we see in the short term necessarily. I would agree with you. And a uh, very funny story, I was in an Uber in New York uh, a week or so ago, and my Uber driver was very proud to tell me that he accepted payments using Bitcoin uh, for you know a ninety some dollar fare, and I said, well, how much is it? How much is it worth now? He says, I, I'm, I watch it every day. He goes, it's worth ninety seven dollars. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, somehow he thought he was going to actually be a millionaire by accepting his his uh, his fare in in Bitcoin. It hasn't quite worked that way for him. Absolutely. And then I believe that the second question was around uh, was something around Chase Pay. Can you just uh, recap yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's 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 a it's a question. So Chase Pay obviously is a is a is a mobile wallet and acceptance uh, mark uh, using Chase products. And uh, the qu the question is related to how do you see that as a potential. Um, offering through your through your bank channel, through your bank channel. Yeah, so I think it's something that we are definitely watching carefully, right? Um, and ultimately to, to to watch the traction there. What's most interesting when you look at a uh, a Chase Pay or what Samsung is doing as well, and particularly the retailer specific mobile apps, right? It's having the retailers come to offer value add discounts and benefits. And so what I what I can say is that we are actively working on and continue to look at how do we leverage the data that we have for, as we get into big data capabilities to partner with retailers, with merchants to bring them new customers and in turn add value to cardholders and our financial institutions. A question about self-service options. Um, anything specific, and do any of the self-service options include include voice, specifically Alexa? That's a, it's a great question. That is something that, um, from a cross-buyer perspective, we are investing in quite quite heavily. So over time, we are. Definitely looking to have uh, Alexa skills added in terms of self-service service from a, a card perspective, um, leveraging some of the, the larger efforts that are underway across the Pfizer family. Um, it's also interesting as you look at there's a number of different platforms for voice, and underpinning mm -hmm. all of that is an investment that we are making collectively in an underlying API infrastructure that allows that functionality to be more readily deployed across more and more channels based on where consumers' expectations are and where their behavior is shifting to. I think voice is an extremely powerful interface, um, so it'll be interesting to see how that, 
how that evolves um, not only here, but just, just broadly across the payments and commerce ecosystem. Well, listen, John, we're just about a, a minute uh, from the top of the hour. Any, any final thoughts from you on the, the, the state of, as we think about 2017 into 2018? Yeah, so I think final thoughts are really that the digital expectations are continuing to, to accelerate, and there's a real opportunity for financial institutions to increase their investments to drive user engagement, right, with those tools, adding more capabilities, adding more services, because those investments just yield significant dividends, not only over the lifetime of a customer in terms of lifetime value, but even a very, very short term with immediate um, P&L pressure that comes from fraud losses. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great conversation, and I think 2018 will see a lot of layering, at least I hope, um, with respect to mobile wallets, their, their form and their function, and getting consumers really focused on on how to use them beyond just a form factor substitute, which um, which I think is is in everyone's best interest. Well, listen, thanks, thanks, John. It was a great conversation. Lots of great data, and all of you who listened today, we will have a replay and a recap article up on payments.com in the next couple of days. We really appreciate your taking the time to listen so intently and to ask such good questions. I hope you have a great rest of the day and a good week. John, to you as well, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. And you too. Happy holidays to everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye now.